Hi, my name's Tom, and today I want to talk to you about Synaptic Strength. I was debating a little bit about this title, but basically it's about the modulation or the change, the ways that we can change um, the strength of EPSPs and IPSPs um, in synapses. So, this is one example that we, that, that, um, that we can do that. Uh, basically, we have, you know, the classic synapse that we've seen before, B synapsing onto, onto C, but we've also got here uh, A synapsing onto the axonal uh, terminal of B. So we have, you know, we've seen this before, you know, a transmitter coming out and binding onto here, having its effect. But the action here isn't uh, what you would expect as over here, because it's not necessarily to do with the opening or closing of ion channels, although it can be, um, because what it can do is it can influence the calcium ion channels, the voltage-gated ones, because as we know, when an action potential comes to, along B, it's going to affect those uh, voltage-gated channels, and it's going to let in calcium, and it's going to let us transmit, uh, you know, release the neurotransmitter. So um, they can affect that directly, you know, they could increase the amount of calcium that's going to be let in, or they could decrease it. Um, but another thing is that is if we're stimulating B regularly, or, you know, if we've stimulated a lot just recently, in the last second or two, um, then the calcium ion concentration between inside and outside the cell might not be as high, that, that difference might not be as high, or, sorry, as different uh, as it was, you know, before all this stimulation. And so, because of that, um, the concentration gradient might not be as strong. We might not get as much calcium coming in. We n might not get as much neurotransmitter coming out. So, um, what, what the cell tries to do is it stores calcium. So, if we have, if we have calcium... Oh, actually, I want to do this maybe in... Let's do it in green. So, we have the action potential come down, and then we have calcium come in. And, you know, it, it binds to, you know, snap to tagman and it all does all that. Um, but the other thing it does is that once it's bound and it's done its thing, it goes into, um, you know, it goes into specialised organelles in the, in the axon terminal because it wants that we want to keep this, it compartmentalised so that we can sort of, we can keep this concentration gradient as strong as possible. Um, so, so A could be modulating the, um, the entry of calcium into the cell, or it could be modulating the entry or the, the, the temporary storage in the, uh, in the specialized organelles of the axon terminal for storage of calcium, uh, ions. So, so that, they're the two ways, basically, that... Uh, sort of an, an axon axonic, an axo axonic synapse can work, um, but it's a little bit complicated, uh, I know. So um, yeah, maybe yeah, just have a think about it or ask questions if you need. Um, so another way though is that we can have the neurotransmitter here release, yada yada, it goes under there. But this isn't the whole story because we actually have receptors here most of the time for it to bind onto itself and you might think well, that's a bit, a bit stupid well actually it's it's kind of clever and it's in it's a very it underpins a very important theme in physiology called negative feedback you might have heard of this term before but um, for those you who haven't it's basically where where we're, we're we're throwing out, you know, in this example, we're throwing out neurotransmitter and it's having an effect. But also, we want to let the cell know that we've we've done that. We've done our job. Um, you know, it, it's okay. You can stop. You can stop doing this now because you've done your job. So um, that's that's a very important theme. Uh, negative feedback, but um, that causes you know the the 
uh, pause in, in synthesis or release or whatever um, in this particular example. But there are heaps of other negative feedback examples. It's, it's a very prominent theme and very important theme. Um, so so there's, there's a couple of ways that we can... These are called autoreceptors, by the way. Um, autoreceptors on, on the actual neuron itself that the neurotransmitter is coming out from. Um, but we can also, we can change, we can modulate this, you know, the effects that these neurotransmitters are going to have. Um, I mean, so far we've seen basically the, all of those mechanisms there, they're, they're changing the amount of neurotransmitter coming out, um, you know, in some way. Um, we can, I mean, we can also change the synthesis um, of you know, because we have precursors which get converted into the neurotransmitter, uh, we could we could uh, inhibit um, enzymes involved in the, that process, or we could try to limit the amount of those precursors made. So that's another way. Um, but also, as we have seen uh, in previous videos, there are these snare proteins which let out the vesicles of um, of neurotransmitter and there's actually a lot of well I mean there are a lot of toxins which can affect these snare proteins um, and actually they can affect especially um, excitatory or inhibitory uh, neurons so um, for example tetanus uh, that you know, pretty much destroys the snare proteins in inhibitory neurons, and that of course causes a uh, fairly, um, fairly extreme muscle contractions. Uh, botulism is another one uh, that's that's targeting inhibitory neurons, though. So that's that's going to cause. Um, oh, sorry, no, I've got it mixed up. Tetanus is is affecting inhibitory neurons. Sorry. So, and that's of course, if you can't inhibit this, this particular neuron for muscle contraction, say, then of course it's going to be more positive. So, you know, if this was an inhibitory pathway and these were inhibitory, you know, this, this, these neurotransmitters were going to cause some sort of inhibition here, then we're going to, um, if we can't get that through, you know, if we can't get it released here, then that's going to end up being more positive and often it'll cause, it, in the case of tetanus, uh, it'll cause muscle contractions. In botulism, uh, it's the opposite. So excitatory pathways, so if this was an excitatory pathway, then it's going to be, and you know, this was blocked, then this would be more negative than it would otherwise be. And, you know, we'll have muscle paralysis. So, so that's, there's a lot of, presynaptic um, modulation or change that we can have in the, synap in the strength of this synapse. Uh, there's also postsynaptic things that we can do. Um, uh, you, I mean, you can consider, of course, the current state, if this is positive or negative, you know, if, if this is well below threshold or well above, you know, or very close to threshold, then our effect um, is going to be, you know, less or more. There can also be antagonists. Um, antagonists are things which bind to the, the same receptor, uh, sometimes irreversibly or reversibly, um, and they can, uh, they basically, they look like the same, you know, that they structurally look like the, the neurotransmitter or the agonist in this, you know, is the technical term for anything that binds to a receptor. So the antagonist is binding to these, you know, receptor sites where the agonist should bind. And of course, it, it means that the agonist can't bind. So it, it sort of limits the amount of agonists or, you know, the amount of neurotransmitter which can, which can uh, bind. Um, we can also have things where, um, well, acetylcholine, of course, or I, uh, we'll talk about that a bit later, but acetylcholine um, 
if this was acetylcholine, this would be shortly um, broken down into the um, into its precursor and taken back up um, into the neuro uh, into the presynaptic uh, neuron, um, and that that is uh, by a, a particular enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. And, um, and so we can have the breakdown of neurotransmitters on the receptor sites. Um, and we can also have these receptors actually be completely, you know, uh, we can have what's called up and down regulation. So we can have these receptor sites actually get taken away or pushed back up, depending on if the cell thinks uh, they're needed. Uh, there's actually a continual cycle, but it's the rate at which this cycles, which is is modulated. Um, so yeah, I mean that's uh, sort of most of the postsynaptic uh, modulations that I can think of. Uh, there's also, of course, you know that like as we said, the reuptake of the um, the neurotransmitter, um, and often, as we said, this can involve uh, glial cells and you know and it can go in and you know go back to it to where it came from in a precursor form um, but and also the 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 amount of space here this is generally 10 to 20 nanometers but you know that's not always the case it could be the synaptic cleft I'm talking about sorry um, this space here it's generally about 10 to 20 nanometers, but it could be much longer, much shorter. Um, it could, you know, it could be uh, the geometry of it could be strange. You know, it could have other things in the way. Uh, it's not not very often, but you know, it, it, those those sort of things can also play a part because of the rate of diffusion. You know, because uh, remember that the neurotransmitter has to diffuse across this synaptic cleft so yeah I hope I hope uh, this helps you appreciate that there are a lot of things which can influence uh, the the impact it can you know influence the amount of influence that an IPSP uh, or an EPSP can have uh, on the the postsynaptic neuron and uh, yeah I hope this has been helpful it's been part 10 synaptic strength